Welcome to Red, White, and Blue. I'm Gary Polland. Uh, this week, my co-host is Jay Iyer, who's a professor at the Barbara Jordan School at Texas Southern University. And this week, we have a very distinguished guest, and we're excited to have yes. him, Mike McCall, who is a congressman uh, who has part of the Houston area in his district, mm -hmm. uh, mostly in the Austin area. And he's chairman of the House Committee on Homeland Security. Uh, you've watched television. He is on all the time talking about critical issues facing the country. So my first question off the bat, a real simple one, what keeps you up at night these days? Now, it used to be my threat briefings on ISIS um, because of the external operations, the plotting to kill Americans. We arrested about one per week in the United States. Uh, in the last two years, special forces, Kurds, uh, we have crushed ISIS in Iraq and Syria. The caliphate has uh, collapsed and my threat briefings have gone down. And that's a good, that's a good news. Cybersecurity, uh, I think, is probably becoming uh, the number one issue facing our national security. Well, talk, let's talk about cybersecurity <clears throat> for a second. We're in the middle of the midterm elections, mm -hmm. lots of people voting, record turnout. And the question people ask often is how secure, how safe are our voting systems? I think they're very safe. And we appropriated $380 million in the Congress for grants to secure voting machines. Um, I think what, what Russia and now we're seeing China starting to play this a little bit as well is this campaign disinformation warfare. Uh, we just had a Russian uh, unsealed indictment against a Russian in St. Petersburg who's using millions of dollars to sow the seeds of discord and chaos in the United States. So they, they take all different sides. All they want is division in the United States and some could argue they may have achieved some of that. Well, I mean, let's talk a little bit about that, kind of unpack it a bit more. I mean, do you see the issue more as sort of infiltrating social media and some of the, the, the public outlets, or do you see it more as kind of trying to hack in our election systems or trying to uh, attack voter databases? What's the biggest threat you see? I, I think, again, they're uh, uh, primarily in disinformation warfare. So it's social media uh, taking you know, one side against another, pitting Americans against Americans. Uh, they really don't care about the outcome. They, they just want us to be divisive. They love chaos. Uh, there was some evidence they tried to get into data, <clears throat> voter rolls, and if that could happen, they could manipulate. So we're very uh, keen on, on that issue as well. But, you know, Homeland Security, uh, uh, been, they've been tasked. All 50 states have been working with DHS to make sure that this midterm election uh, goes without, uh, without any problems. The, uh, the, the Russian probe that's been going on for a couple of years now led by former FBI Director Mueller, is that part of the Russian goal to sow disinformation and discord in America? Because if so, they're damn successful. Well, I think, I think they do like the division that they see going on with that probe. I got briefed to uh, what's called the Gang of Eight in October 2016 on the fact that uh, the Russians, and straight out of the Kremlin, uh, both their sort of CIA component and military were, in fact, trying to influence our uh, elections. And at that time, I called upon Jay Johnson, the secretary, and the administration to call Russia out for what they were doing and that there should be consequences. Um, I said the same thing to this administration. Congress passed sanctions uh, against Russia for doing this. And so I think the good news is that Russia, they know we're on to them. And we've seen the uh, engagement, the intensity of the engagement, has actually decreased. Uh, it's not nowhere near where it was in 2016. So there's progress. I think so. Yeah, yeah you've, been, you've been pretty forceful in, in uh, I think, acknowledging or, or wanting to shine a light that, that there was Russian interference in 2016. I guess the question is, what do you see in terms of Russian interference or interference from China or anywhere else for potentially 2018 and, and 2020? And what do you think we, you, that we ought to be doing that we're not doing right now to make it more secure? Well, just anecdotally, I, I prosecuted the Johnny Chung case. He led me to the director of Chinese intelligence. Working with China Aerospace, they like Clinton's policies on satellite technology transfers. They gave uh, Chung money to put in his Hong Kong bank account to reelect uh, then President Clinton. So my point is, this is nothing new. The idea of a foreign adversary power trying to influence a presidential campaign goes back to when I was a young prosecutor at DOJ. They just have, have a new tool now, it's called the internet. And so they have exploited the internet very effectively uh, trying to uh, influence and, and meddle in our elections. Uh, do, are we uh, punishing them on the internet for what they're trying to do to us? 
Yeah, we, we've had uh, uh, 18 indictments come down. We had the sanctions come down. I've repeatedly said that Putin is not our friend. Putin, Russia is very aggressive. And they're aggressive with their neighboring uh, nations that they would like to uh, take back the glory of the old Soviet empire, like uh, Ukraine. Right. Uh, they would love nothing more than, you know, there was a kinetic war on the eastern front of Ukraine, but there's also a cyber war going on every day. They're throwing their best capabilities in Ukraine right now. And we're learning a lot about their capabilities by capturing that, that stuff. One example, they hit a, a bank in Ukraine that impacted Maersk shipping with a, a very destructive malicious code called Nonpetua. Destroyed 20 years or 15 years of data in the company. And because they control a third of the Los Angeles port, it literally shut down the Los Angeles port for, for about a day or two. That's the power of cyber uh, and cyber warfare. Yeah, we saw some of that in, in Atlanta when the Atlanta airport went down, the city of Atlanta goes down. Um, there's been different municipalities. Do you see them changing sort of directions and making the, the, the warfare a little more directed towards government installations, oil and gas in, installations, et cetera? Well, you know, I, I, not getting into classified, but I think our, our intelligence community, military have been compromised. I think our, our SCADA systems, industrial control, power grids, I think their fingerprints are on that, which means they have the power to turn it off. So imagine a power grid going down in the northeast. Fortunately, here in Texas, we have air cats. We, we're right. very isolated and protected. But if the northeast power grid went down, that would be uh, catastrophic. And in addition to that, there's the espionage. Uh, China is primarily engaged in this. They steal about $600 billion in intellectual property uh, per year. Uh, they want to steal medical research from our top medical research facilities. Uh, they have a thousand talents program in the United States to steal from our academic uh, institutions. They stole 20 million security clearances from the federal government, including mine. Uh, and there were zero consequences to China uh, for doing that. And so my view, I pushed the administration say, look, when they do this to us, uh, you have to, we have to have consequences. Just because it's cyber doesn't mean it's not espionage or it's not an act of warfare. Speaking of that, do you think that uh, Trump's tariffs uh, efforts are a way to punish China for some of the stuff, the stealing of intellectual property, the unfair trade? Yeah, I think the, the technology transfers, the, the stealing from, you know, our def defense contractors compromising national security. I think that's part of it, the component of, of that. And then I think it's what's interesting is that China now is putting ads in newspapers uh, clandestinely. Uh, going against the president on the tariffs in, in this country. Is yeah, so their campaign, they're part of the campaign against it. That's their they campaign want disinformation. Want us to surrender. It. Right. Well, well, what would you like us to, I mean, what would you think we should be doing that we're not doing now? How can we protect ourselves, um, both as a country and an individual, sort of the, mo the more vulnerable areas uh, across the country? What would you like to see happen? Well, if I, not to go back in time, but 2014, 2015, we were having this discussion about what is the role of the federal government? We, we're very good at our offensive capability. We can shut down countries wholesale. Uh, we do that with kinetic wars, but we put our cyber uh, forces in there. Um, what was not well defined at that time was what is the role of the federal government in defense of the nation? So we mapped up a strategy. Uh, I passed a Cybersecurity Act that, that basically authorized the Department of Homeland Security to be the lead civilian agency to the private sector to share threat information with liability protection. That liability protection was key, and they can share private to private as well. That uh, defined the role of DHS, FBI investigates, uh, NSA and Cyber Command have that offensive capability. In a time of warfare, the DOD would stand up, um, but, but those roles got codified in 2015. And since that time, I've been trying to build up the capabilities within Department of Homeland Security. A lot of people were skeptical at the time they could stand up. So we appropriated more money. Uh, I just got my cybersecurity uh, agency bill passed out of the Senate. So this will be a stand up, stand alone agency within the department to deal with cybersecurity threats, elevating the director to the same level that say the FEMA administration has, the TSA administrator has. Um, this will elevate and uh, prioritize the mission within DHS. Is there a federal government program to encourage uh, utilities to harden harden themselves against cyber warfare? Well, I think uh, 
the program is DHS can come in and do any diagnostic checks, you know, on uh, utility companies. Uh, they're constantly working with the 16 critical infrastructure sectors uh, to reinforce them. There's oil and gas, there's energy, there's finance. Um, and, and so um, we passed a lot in the scholarship for service program, you know, 3,000 graduates now to get a better cyber workforce in the federal government. We have these incident response teams that now can interact with the private sector because the private sector harnesses a lot of the expertise to work with the federal government to better protect our uh, infrastructure. Well, Europe has kind of a much more codified regulatory structure as it relates to the internet. Do you, and we, we talk about regulation in the past, we don't want to regulate the internet very much. Do you, do, is, there, is there a need to do something to try to create some sort of parameters within the existing access points for, it, for the internet? Well, because DHS is not a regulator, that was right. a perfect go-to department, right? And that's what, that's what the private sector would tell me. We want to interact with DHS. They can't regulate. This is all post-Snowden, too. So the NSA doing this was not uh, you know, very politically popular at that time, uh, to say the least. So the DHS is, um, you know, they, they've become the leader uh, on this. Uh, the administration has doubled down on it, on this concept. Um, and all the legislation I've passed has helped uh, build up their capability. Is there, I was going to ask you, is there a partisan divide on this issue, or are the both sides working together? This is one of those uh, <clears throat> good news Washington stories where both sides actually work together. Uh, it, to it, could, it did get a little bit tangled up with the, you know, the Russian interference in the elections, but we managed to, to work all that out. And, um, you know, this is, a, this is not a Republican-Democrat issue. It's a national security issue for Americans. And it's in our interest to better protect Americans from this threat of intellectual property theft, of espionage in the United States, and cyber warfare. How, how can we better elevate this conversation in terms of getting people to know about it? Because we were talking yeah. offline, and, and you just said this is the number one security threat to the United States. It, it's not registering out there in terms of the, the public's mind. It, it, it's, it's starting to. I mean, it used to be people would get a glazed over look. I would go back to the 93 World Trade Center bombing, uh, Al-Qaeda. Nobody had any idea who these people were in 93. It took a 9-11 event for people to know who bin Laden was, even though he declared war and we had the USS Cole attack and the embassies in Africa. It took a 9-11 to, to capture the imagination of the American people that we need to do something about this. And so I think our military and Department of Homeland Security and FBI all get this concept. What, one of your questions is, what do we need to do moving forward? I would say on the international front, uh, how do you deal with an act of cyber warfare against, uh, say, a NATO ally? Would Article 5 be invoked in that situation? Uh, there are no rules of the road. This is a wild west. It is a wild frontier with no rules. This is why the Chinese can steal 20 million security clearances with zero consequences. Why Russia tried to meddle in our elections with no consequences until we pass the sanctions. So. I would argue that we have to, by, uh, have to have some norms, uh, standards, rules of the roads, and, and treaties with foreign countries in terms of how to deal with cyber. We'd be remiss if we didn't talk about sort of these sort of non-cyber related, but, but two big issues out there related to DHS. Um, the first being, we know that there were 10 packages sent uh, to, to Democratic officials um, <clears throat> with bombs in them. What can you tell us about that? I know that you, you as you chair of the committee, um, is there any, any information you can, you can shed some light on? Well, I mean, the, the investigation is still very active ongoing. My senses are closing in. Uh, I remember going through the Austin bombing. Uh, in that case, all the, the bombs exploded, so a lot of the evidence and forensics was destroyed. Uh, in, in this case, all 10 uh, did not explode. So we have great uh, forensic evidence to trace back to the suspect, uh, particularly the black tape that will get fingerprints, for instance. Uh, any DNA evidence on those uh, devices we can get. The parts themselves, where were they purchased, like we did in the Austin bombing. So I think we're, and also these packages were mailed, so you've got the, the Postal Service stamping to try to trace back to the origins of where it came from. Uh, so I would not, uh, a lot of people want to conclude about the politics of all this, I, I would say as a former federal pro prosecutor, I would wait and see where the evidence takes you before you draw any assumptions. Is there a possible foreign involvement? Uh, there, possible, uh, I don't think it's likely. I think this is a, uh, 
kind of like a Kaczynski style type bombing with less sophistication. I mean, he misspelled names. <laughs> These are very rudimentary uh, pipe bombs. Still very uh, dangerous though. The, the other, the other big right. DHS issue, of course, is the caravan um, of five thousand or plus fourteen thousand, um, <laughs> whatever the number is. A second caravan it, it coming. Keeps, keeps keeps growing or keeps changing, I guess, uh, from from Central America here uh, in the United States. What can we do? What should we be doing uh, in terms of of dealing with and addressing this issue in a in a, in a thoughtful way? Well, a couple of things. I mean, I think we need to work with Central America to stop the root cause of why they want to come up in the first place. Secondly, Mexico's got a 200-mile border we can seal easier than our 2,000. Um, <clears throat> I introduced my border security bill that would have provided physical infrastructure, uh, the uh, technology, the boots on the ground, air, land, and sea. Chairman Goodlap uh, reformed immigration to more merit-based, but also closed these legal loopholes. We have decisions case law and statutory that say within 20 days, a family unit has to be released into society. Um, we want to treat Central Americans the same way we treat the Mexican people. If you come here from Mexico, you're removed immediately. If you come here from Central America, you're caught and then released into society. Until we change that rule, the deterrence is not going to be there. So I talked to, we also legalized the DACA children, by the way, as well, which I thought yeah, right. was a very right. <clears throat> important move for particularly our party, uh, to be a little more compassionate on the issue. Um, but uh, I think uh, I talked to the Mexican ambassador uh, just this morning about, you know, we have these uh, states, um, we have tr uh, treaties with Canada, where if you are a, a safe country and you're coming from an unsafe country, they have to apply for asylum in that country. So that means that if they're coming from Central America through Mexico, uh, theoretically, the fear of persecution has ended and they should apply for asylum in Mexico. So I think we need an agreement with Mexico to accomplish that. In the short term, without that, I think we need, uh, I think we need asylum claim um, facilities uh, where these 7,000, maybe 14,000 now can now make their application for asylum in Mexico where then it can be uh, adjudicated. Yeah, isn't the problem with uh, the, the current law created primarily by uh, liberal federal courts, 20 days and you're released and, and you're told when to return to court and then what percent actually show up? Not much. About uh, 5%. And nothing happens because they didn't do that. So then they're into the country. So I guess my question is, it looks like, you know, there are people in Washington like you that have tried over the years to bring common sense to our immigration <laughs> laws, working with uh, your colleagues, but we don't make any progress. We're in the same place we were 10 years ago, 15 mm -hmm. years ago. Uh, those who are suggesting we should go for amnesty like Reagan in the deal he made with the Democrats in his era, mm -hmm. that was supposed to mean the border was closed, That's not right. restart the clock and let everybody flow in again so we can do it all over. So how do we avoid that situation? And you're right. <clears throat> when Reagan granted amnesty, he was promised that the security piece would, would get done. It was never appropriated. So here we are, how many years later, with about 15 to 20 million illegals in the country. It's created a real problem. Um, our bill, uh, Chairman Gillette and, and my bill, um, we put it on the floor. Um, and sadly, not to get too partisan, but every Democrat voted against it. So it failed uh, on the floor. And had we passed that, I think we could have resolved this caravan issue. We could have secured the border. And I was watching you know, Chuck Schumer nine years ago talk about, you know, there's legal and illegal immigration. And until we fix the illegal immigration piece, you'll never have immigration reform. It sounded a lot like what I say. And I think he's right. I don't normally agree right. with Chuck Schumer. He was right. It was nine years ago that until you give the American people confidence that you've secured the border, you have stopped the illegal flow, until that happens, I think Americans are going to be generous on this and, and look at guest worker programs and, and, and programs to legalize. So, so going forward, you think, let's, let's sort of look ahead past the elections. We're going to have a new, uh, if we have a new Congress, assuming you're, you're in the majority, do you see yourself putting this <clears throat> bill out again or uh, working potentially, the Democrats take the House, uh, working with them to try to do uh, some sort of immigration reform along the lines that we're talking about? Well, I think you're going to see it sooner in the next Congress. You're going to see it the minute we get back up there after the election because the caravans put this front and center again. And remember, this is the end of this Congress. We haven't finished all of our appropriations, primarily Homeland Security. 
uh, because it is contentious. And we are going to have to find the funding um, to pay for the department and also pay for what the president calls a wall. I call it a wall barrier system, but pay for that border security. And, uh, and it's clear that what we have now isn't working. Well, Border Patrol tells me they only know about 50% of what comes in, which means that 50% you don't know. I can tell you this ICE program, it's, 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 it's fashionable to, to bash ICE, but we have a biometric program that ICE uh, administers. Uh, so when you come into the hemisphere, your name may change, but your identity doesn't change. And we, we stopped hundreds of known or suspected terrorists from entering this country under the program. Yeah, in fact, I was going to ask on, on the, the caravan also known as the invasion. Uh, do we even know who's there? Do we know who's supporting it? I mean, this is not, uh, my take is, it's not accidental. There is an organized, this is an organized effort. Somebody's funding it. Somebody's providing toilets, porta toilets, food, transportation, because you know, they show, the media shows them walking and the media leaves and they get on, they, then their trucks and buses show up to move them faster so they get closer to the border. So I'm trying to, do we have any idea where this is coming from? Well, yeah, we know it started with the uh, leftist opposition in Honduras. And I'm not, I'm not leaking that to anybody in the United States. It's the, the leftist opposition to the current governments in, mm -hmm. in Honduras. Uh, started this whole caravan uh, concept, and then it's gained momentum as it moves up towards and in Mexico. Do we know who's in there? I think Secretary Pompeo said we don't know, really have a good accounting. Most of them are family units. Uh, you've seen it on the television. Um, but we do know that some uh, people from the Middle East are there as well, and that's what concerns me always about it. MS-13 well, also. Con Congress, can you talk a little bit about this? This, isn't a, this is not a Mexico problem. This is a Central American problem. Mm -hmm. So what are we doing to engage with the Honduran, the Salvadoran, Guatemalan governments to try to bolster them up, to at least prevent people from leaving for opportunity? Because as I think we can all concede that the vast majority of the folks coming here are coming here for economic reasons, for, to better their lives and to escape sort of narco-terrorism that's mm -hmm. going on down there. Yeah, I think without question, uh, it's hard to blame somebody for wanting to leave those conditions. And without question, if you're going to give your entire life savings, $6,000, to right. a coyote to take your 12-year-old daughter, you're desperate. You're, yeah. you're desperate. And there's something that's wrong down there. So we have the Central America Security Initiative to try to establish rule of law in these countries because they're, they're really, it's when you have destabilized countries, this is when the problems you get. Well, I mean, th th I guess that's my point. How are we ever going to solve the problem w without trying to restabilize those nations. If we keep sending back folks that, as, as you're saying, aren't, aren't great people, aren't we just gonna exacerbate the problem? We've gotta fundamentally get in there and root At out least the issue. I wanna ask this question. You'd rather have them here? The bad people? Well, I, I don't want the bad okay. people anywhere, just but I'm just saying just I, I don't want them to keep coming because the issue ends up being it costs us so much to detain them here. It costs us so much to deal with it. In the long run, it might make more sense to try to figure out ways to economically bring the free market down to Central America, uh, try to make it work to try to create economic opportunities down there. Yeah, and the root cause is destabilization. So right. it's in our best interest to stabilize Central America, just like we tried to uh, stabilize the situation in Iraq and Syria, maybe not so well. When you have destabilized Libya, look what you get there. All throughout uh, Africa, Northern Africa, Sub-Sahara and Sahel is destabilizing and what we're seeing are these extremist groups popping up out of Africa that are a threat to our national security. So it's in our best interest to stabilize. And we do have CAFTA. And a lot of people yes, yeah, it's great, great we, we have a free trade agreement with Central America that I think should help. But I think, I, I agree, we have to look at the root cause. Uh, let's say, let's take worst case scenario. They don't get stopped in Mexico. 14,000 people show up. I guess it's gonna be California because they don't wanna to come to Texas to deal with our National Guard, I guess. What do we do? do and it do depends it? how this hurricane you know, plays out, in oh, what that, direction. Yeah, that's a good uh, point. It, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm working very intensely uh, with the administration and the Mexican government, and I'll be talking to, again to, our, to the Mexican ambassador. So you're looking, you're looking for a solution. To stop, stop it. Is, is there any chance we could get the Mexican government to cooperate and, and at least start the processing of, uh, of, their, of some of these asylum claims in Mexico. And well, when I talk to the ambassador, uh, he, they, I don't think they'll sign this agreement that I was talking about. However, I think they will help facilitate taking these asylum applications uh, in, in a heightened awareness sense in Mexico. That, that's the best hope we have because, Gary, once they're in, 
They're here. Yeah, and and part of the problem is if you, you, if you come, you can stay, right? That's the message. They have out-marketed us. They They're have. winning the marketing in this issue. Well, maybe we need a sign at the border that says trespassers will be shot, That's survivors a, will be well, how prosecuted. About this? How about this? Trespassers won't be employed. I mean, one of the parts <laughs> that I've wondered about is why we don't have more enhancements for for, or, or penalties for people that are employing undocumented folks here in the United well, States. Well, we, we the last comments. So, go no, ahead. so it has to be a message. If you come, right. you can't stay. That's a deterrence. He verified. That was in our mm -hmm. bill as well. That requires all employers to, to verify that this person is legal. Uh, that would have a tremendous impact. But what we also did was we had an ag guest worker program attached to that because we Great. didn't want to, you know, we didn't want to do e verify and then the ag community couldn't find any workers. And that would be the first step to what Texas used to have called the Brucero program, yeah. which I thought worked pretty well. And that means you can come and uh, work and stay mm -hmm. here, but go back home to your family for Christmas and whenever you want to. Unfortunately, it was the it was Cesar Chavez union movement that, that he destroyed. Want, he didn't like illegal immigration on that note. Congressman McCall, thank you so much for coming. You have been most interesting. Well, we'd love to have you back to report to Southeast Texas about what's going on. No, thank thanks, you. Gary. And Jay, uh, thank you so much for being here this thanks, week. Thanks, Gary. This was great. I enjoyed, I enjoyed it. Enjoyed uh, we'll be back next week on Red, White, and Blue with another scintillating guest or guests and uh, <laughs> topics. I think next week we're going to do election preview.